this feature. Okay, sounds good. Good morning. As Rob alluded to, my wife Allie is on the worship team here, and I want to share a quick story um, about the first time that I went back to Allie's home church in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. Um, we'd been dating for a while, and it was my first time going back to uh, meet some of the uh, family members and some of the other people in her church family there in Rhinelander. And uh, the culture of Allie's family and the people in her network, they were all musicians. So, you know, everybody played something, they sang something, they had a part in the choir, uh, maybe they were in the handbells. And so there were these um, uncommunicated expectations on me. Um, and so I was met with this interrogation of, um, nice to meet you, Tom. What part do you sing? I think they're already kind of plotting for where they could infuse me somewhere. I said, oh, I don't sing. I, you know, maybe I sing along with the radio, but I don't, I don't have a part. I'm not a tenor, I'm not a bass, none of that. And their follow-up question was, oh, okay, so what do you play? And my response to them was, quarterback. And <laughs> it, it, was, it was in a moment before, it took, it took me a moment to realize they were asking what instrument I played, and so I, I didn't meet that expectation either. And luckily, we were able to overcome the fact that I'm not musical, I'm not a musician, and that um, there are other things that we had in common that we could build upon. And since that time, Allie and I have gone on, we've gotten married, had two kids, moved out to Colorado, and I still have great relationships with those people in Rhinelander, and they joke about, you know, getting me involved in the music there when I come back, um, and I tell them, no, you can have Allie for the weekend, and she can play and sing, but uh, we'll be in the congregation. Um, so at any rate, wanted to uh, start off with that story, um, my first infusion to Allie's culture back in Rhinelander, and then I want to tell you um, one more story um, about our kids. So Eli and Natalie, currently Eli's eight, Natalie's seven, and they've got a great relationship with each other at times, and uh, they have great trust. And the story I want to tell you is about a time when Eli was four and Natalie was three. We were in Minnesota at my parents' house, and we were um, going for a walk before breakfast. And when we go to Minnesota, there's, there, we usually find a bucket or a pail, and we go for walks, and we look for anything we can put in that bucket, right? So whether it's a frog, a snake, um, a turtle, we found out that we put a, a snake and a frog in at the same time. Sometimes it's just a snake with a big belly after a little while. Um, but anything that we can pick up and put in the bucket, that's what Eli and Natalie want to do. And at this particular um, summer, Eli being age four, Natalie being age three, we were on the walk. And Eli didn't take him long before he was out in front looking for things, and Natalie was behind, and I was behind the, the two of them. And Natalie is, is naming things as we go, and she sees something land on the grass, and she goes, Eli, Dad, I see a dinosaur. And immediately, Eli froze, and like the hair on his neck stood up, and he believed that there was a dinosaur. I mean, like, I wish I had a video. My son was in Jurassic Park in that moment. And he slowly turned, and once he got sight of it, he noticed it was a dragonfly. He goes, oh, Natalie, that, that's a dragonfly. And she goes, yeah, dragonfly, like, like that's what I said. <laughs> the, the reason I share that story, it's a great story, and I love the, the things that it exemplifies between Eli and Natalie, but at age four and at age three, there's a level of trust there that, that you really can't replicate somewhere else. You can build it through other ways as you get older, but that level of trust, like she said there was a dinosaur, he believed there was a dinosaur. And that aspect of trust is a really important aspect of establishing championship culture in the home. And we're gonna, we won't talk about all of them today, but we're going to talk about a few. And um, in addition to trust, we're going to talk about commitment. So right now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to um, turn to, in your bulletin, there should have been an insert. And in that insert, there, um, there are pillars that uh, we've established at Palmer Ridge High School and three foundational layers. And those foundational layers um, include healthy personal relationships, loyalty, and work ethic. And I, I could talk for days on just those three foundations. I could talk well, for a long time on, on any one of these pillars. But the concept that I want you to, to hear from this is, I'm going to just drive right to the point, and that is, okay, it starts with healthy personal relationships. And without those, I don't think that we've got a good foundation for anything else that we're going to try to establish. And if you want championship culture in the home, and we'll talk much more about that here in the, in the minutes to come, but there are really things that, um, that I would say are negotiable. You could, you could Google uh, what are the things that establish great culture in the family, and you could get eight to ten, and they would be different pillars than what's here, okay? For us at Palmer Ridge Football, this is a collaborative effort including players and coaches and it's been a four year deal going on and we're gonna to continue to hone in on this. But I'm gonna tell you that the things we're gonna talk about today are, are mission critical to any of this existing and, and those things that we're gonna talk about today include having a vision for your family, having commitment, and then um, engaging in a mentorship process. And so 
the, the, the graphic that I want to reference here includes commitment, includes team before me, passion, and so on, and all of those things are critical to what we're doing at Palmer Ridge. But when it comes to establishing championship culture in the home, there are some things that we'll talk about as it relates specifically to um, how to establish the kind of culture that you want in your home. Well, um, I hope that you can tell by now that it's one of my life's passions to develop great young men that hopefully through our process will become better sons, excellent brothers, and someday outstanding husbands and phenomenal fathers. I'm privileged to be able to do that at Palmer Ridge High School, both as a PE teacher and as a head football coach, but I want to tell you that it, it takes a village. I couldn't, I couldn't do those jobs without phenomenal people around me. The standard that I keep in mind throughout the process that we have built at Palmer Ridge, if we're fortunate to have somebody in our program for four years, is would I be okay with this young man dating my daughter, right, when she's 35? Um, but would I be okay with this young man dating my daughter? Okay, and that's a gold standard. That doesn't move left or right, up or down, based on somebody else's home life or based on the circumstances they came out of. There's a standard that we set. And we wouldn't be able to hold that standard. We wouldn't be able to uphold our culture if we didn't have a vision statement for that. And we're in a, t we're in a series titled Healthy Relationships, Healthy Homes. And I'm honored to be here this morning to have a chance to share some of the things that I've learned about culture, about commitment, and about vision and how you can apply these in your home and in your family. The question that I want to wrestle with this morning is, is our current culture helping us to be the kind of family that God has called us to be? I'm going to say that one more time. Is our current culture helping us be the kind of family that God has called us to be? I want to tell one story before we unpack culture, one more story, and that's about a time where it was several years ago, Eli and Natalie were younger, Allie was out of town. She was in Ohio for the weekend, and it was during football season. And so there was a, you know, I always feel like I'm in a race against time on the weekends during football season, even when Allie is in town. But this particular weekend, there was a lot to get done, and so I'd asked a friend to come over. We were watching film. We're drawing scout cards, and um, it got late. There was a candle that was lit in the bathroom, and uh, after my friend Nick left, um, I had fallen asleep on the couch. And that candle was in a jar, and the edges of the jar started to get charred and black. And so the smoke that was coming up out of there was leaving like a blackish residue on the walls. And so when I woke up and I realized what was going on, blew the candle out, my mind immediately raced to, what can I do to clean this up so that Allie doesn't find out, right? Trust is such an important thing in championship culture, but I wanted to get this thing cleaned up. And so I got a washcloth, started washing the walls, and it still looked like it, I didn't take care of the problem. It still looked black in the same areas. And so I went and I got some paint from the garage. I got a floodlight. I turned it on, and I started touching up the paint. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you. Maybe it's just my own bad luck. But when I was touching up the paint, it was like the more I did it, the worse it looked. And so I had to go to a paint store the next day, get more paint, get rollers. I painted two walls in the bathroom, everything from tape and prep to whatever. And um, you know, trying to get ready before Allie comes home as well as getting the game plan done for the next week. And when I had the floodlight in there and I had painted, it looked great. When I moved the floodlight back to the garage, when I turned on the lights in the bathroom, still that shadowing effect. And it wasn't until I stopped and thought about it, looked at the whole thing, kind of zoomed out, and I realized that there was dust on the light bulbs above the mirror in the bathroom. And I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. It's like, it's, in the bathroom, it's like a sticky dust. Like, you couldn't just wipe it off. I had to get new light bulbs. Once the new light bulbs were in, everything looked great. Everything looked, I wish I would have learned that a little bit sooner. <laughs> but I learned a lesson, and that is, if, if we're to zoom out in our life and to understand what the symptoms are, like painting the walls, and then also understand what the source of those symptoms are, I think we're going to be able to better direct our energy and our time regarding the outcome. So if we know what the light bulb is that we need to change, we can spend less time painting, we can be more effective in what we're doing. And I think that same principle holds true when it comes to culture, because if we zoom out and we think about where we're at right now in our lives and where we want to be, there's a different way that we can use our energy if we have a vision established. If we don't have that vision established, it may be difficult for us to see what the source is, whether it's a light bulb, whether it's a wall, whatever it is. So I share that story and I want you to keep in mind the process. I want you to think about walls versus light bulb. I want you to think about if we're going to establish the right kind of culture in our home, okay, and again, that question, is our current culture helping us be the kind of family that God has called us to be? If the answer is yes, how do we know? And if the answer is no, or we don't know, what can you do about that? Okay, so that, that's really going to frame where we're going today. Um, that big question of, is our current culture helping us be the kind of family that God has called us to be? 
All right, so quickly, let's unpack culture, okay? That question of how important is culture is a great question. And some of you, like me, aren't going to like this next response, but I'm going to answer a question with a question. How important is water to a fish in an aquarium? That's, that's the best analogy that I've heard. Business author Jay Conger writes, culture is like water in an aquarium. Even though it's largely invisible, its chemistry and life-supporting qualities profoundly affect every, all of its inhabitants. Leaders, and I'm going to speak specifically to men a number of times throughout this sermon, but it applies to everybody that's interested in transformational leadership. Leaders must understand the vital role that culture plays. For example, if water in a fish tank is polluted, if it's dark, if it's cold, contaminated, you can't see anything that you're looking for. You might look for fish and just see movement. You might look for plants, rocks. You may not be able to see any of that. All you see is polluted water. In that analogy, the culture in that tank would prevent people from reaching their full potential. But on the contrast, if water in the fish tank is clear, if it's fresh, if it's pure, if it's clean, if it's warm, you don't even notice it. When you look in, you see exactly what you expect to see. You see the fish, you see the rocks, you see the plants. Maybe you can even identify the fish, the colors on the fish. And in that analogy, that's where people thrive. Church, I'm going to tell you today that if the culture in your family isn't what you want it to be, I believe that we need a God-centered vision to help you calibrate what you want it to be and that Jesus can clean up that water. Okay, if the water is dirty, polluted, contaminated, and you want something else, I believe that Jesus is that answer to help you clean up that water so that you can be about what you want to be about and that you and your family can reach your full potential in terms of the type of family God's calling you to be. So if culture is that important, what is culture? Simply put, culture is how things are done in your family. Stated and unstated expectations of you and your family members, everything from what instrument do you play to what part of the, of the choir are you in, to are elbows on or off the table? Where in the house is it okay to run? Where is it not okay? The standards of behavior in and outside the home, on and off the field, those are all aspects of culture. One thing that I think is really important to understand is that the way you treat and relate to each other is a huge part of your culture. That might be the first thing that somebody else sees from an outside, outside perspective looking in on your family is the way that you treat and relate to one another. So an academic definition of culture might be that culture is the powerful and pervasive set of collective beliefs, values, and standards that subtly yet significantly influence and impact everyone and everything in your environment. I'm not going to reread that, but I'm going to go back to what I hold on to. Simply put, culture is how things get done in your family. The how things, how things are done. Throughout the first chapter of Ruth, we will find indicators of culture when we pay attention to what Naomi and Ruth believe, value, and how it influences them. And I want you to consider, what did Jesus believe? What did Jesus value? And how did it influence him? I want you all to understand that the question is not, do you have culture? We all have culture. The more important question is, what kind of culture do, do we currently have? But the 10 times more important question is, is our current culture helping us to be the kind of family that God has called us to be? And today, I really want to get after, what if that question is, I don't know? Or what if that question is no? Understand that you have the ability to create the kind of culture you want in your family, but it requires vision. And I'm going to add that it requires Christ. Vision for, for where you want your family to go and who you'd like your family to be is essential. The question that we're going to take head on in the next few minutes is, do you have a vision for your family? Understand that culture without vision is floating and reactive. Culture with vision is intentional. In a moment, I'd like to introduce you to someone in scripture who did not have a vision for his family. But before that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, please open up our minds and our hearts to your instruction for us through your word. We pray that you would prepare the hearts of the families and the singles that are here today, Father God, that they would be able to take back uh, the, the takeaways from this message and that it would be able to influence their lives in a change for the better, improving their culture and helping them seek vision for you, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we launch into Ruth, we're going to start at the last verse in Judges. Judges chapter 21, verse 25. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me. If you, maybe you've got your phone or you've got a tablet, um, please dial in Judges 21, verse 25. And this morning I'll be reading out of the NIV.
In those days, verse 25, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they, see, as they saw fit. There's a lot more here that we could backtrack to, but I'm starting here at the last verse in Judges because I want to put it in context for what's about to happen in Ruth. The last verse of Judges indicates that there was a cycle that existed for approximately 400 years. And this cycle was that the Israelites would sin and rebel against God, that God would send enemies against them, Israel would then cry out, and God in his mercy would send a judge, and that judge would defeat the enemies. This would happen around every 80 years or so. So that cycle of sin and rebel against God, God would send enemies against them. Israel cries out, God in his mercy sends a judge, and the judge defeats their enemies. Happened about five times, again, every 80 years or so. So it happened for about 400 years. I'm saying this to tell you that the man that we're going to look at in Ruth, his name is Elimelech, he's probably not the only one at the time that doesn't have a vision for his family. He's probably not the only one who's floating through and making reactive decisions based on what he felt was maybe best at the time, but maybe out of congruence with God's word and God's calling on his life. So now turn with me, please, to Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpha, the other Ruth. After they lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. I'm going to speak about Elimelech in just a second, and I know that there are people here that are like, you're, you're focusing on Elimelech? Like Naomi just went through the loss of her husband, she's in a different land, her, her sons married pagan women, her sons, okay, we'll get to Naomi. Okay, we'll get to Naomi. But I want to start with the light bulb. I want to start with the source, start with Elimelech. Elimelech is the man that did not have a vision for his family. God's word to Israel was clear at this time to be separate from the pagan people around them. They were not to intermarry with pagan people that were around them. And if you were to ask Elimelech why he's making the decisions he's making, his answer would probably be, I don't know. It just seemed to be the best decision at the time. There was a famine in the land. I needed to do something so that my family could eat. Now I'm speculating here but he might be making those big decisions because it's the thing that seemed best at the time. And he may even have been unaware that the decisions that he was making did not reflect confidence in God's word. I would further speculate that he did not have a vision for his family. We need a God-centered vision for our family, or we run the risk of floating through life, doing whatever seems best at the time. So my question to you is, do you have a vision statement for your family? I want you to think about that, and I'm going to scale back, and I'm going to talk about a vision statement through two different lenses, one through Palmer Ridge football, and another through the Pulford family, okay? Palmer Ridge football, our vision statement is that we're working relentlessly to become the best program in the state. That frames our why. That frames why we have workouts every day after school, providing opportunities for kids to get better why we have early morning workouts, why, why we provide opportunities for our kids to come to camp at our campus for five days before we go off to a university and compete against other schools, why we have seven-on-seven seven opportunities throughout the summer. The list goes on and on. The reason why is consistent. Our vision statement is that we're working relentlessly to be the best program in the state. And if that's what we're going to become, then we need to have a process that's going to allow us to become that. A vision statement is like a magnetic north for everybody in the organization. It points them in the, in the same direction and allows the energy to be moving towards the same goal. So what does that look like in the home? And church, I want to be completely honest with you. I'm going to share this next part, but before I began preparing for this sermon, the Pulford family did not have a vision statement. So since 2012, I would get up in the morning, I'd go to Palmer Ridge, we'd work. This is our vision statement, best program in the state, best program in the state. What does that look like from a staffing standpoint? What does that look like from community relations standpoint? All of those things. And then I'd come home, no vision statement. The Lord really pressed upon me when I was working on this sermon. Okay, Tom, that's great what you got going on Palmer Ridge. Do you have a vision statement for your family? And we didn't. We didn't. So if, if, you're in the, if you're in the chair today and you're thinking, okay, you're challenging me on a vision statement and you didn't have one for yourself, yep, 
that's right. Now I do. Now, I, now we do. But understand that if you don't have a vision statement for your family, it's okay. You're probably in the majority. Okay? But I believe that in order for you to have the kind of culture that you want, in order for us to evaluate whether our culture is helping us become what, the, what God wants us to be, you have to have a vision statement. It's just like an objective when you're teaching a lesson. Okay? I'll go observe other teachers at Palmer Ridge, and they'll say, wasn't that a great lesson? And I'll say, I don't know. What was the objective? Because if, if the objective was X, then you knocked it out of the park. If the objective was Y, maybe we need to look at that. The vision to culture is like an objective to a lesson. And I think it's important that we um, have a good grasp of that as we move forward. Okay, so again, I'm owning the fact that we didn't have a vision statement in our family, but I want to tell you what the Lord has, has helped us through on this. I believe that for great championship, for great culture or championship culture to exist, there's got to be a clear and compelling vision. And again, Pol Palmer Ridge football had a vision statement. Pulford family did not. Did Allie and I talk about logistics? Yep. We talked about, you know, the, who's going to go grocery shopping. We talked about who's going to get the kids on Friday, all those things. I would say we were talking at a three foot level, but we didn't have that 30,000 foot view of a statement that was governing what we were about within our family. We've grown and now we have a vision statement. And my challenge to you, and this is men in particular, is to collaboratively create a vision statement for your family so that you can strategically pursue becoming the family that God has called you to be. We'll talk more about the practical side of that towards the end of the message, okay? But for right now, I want to share with you the Pulford, vision, the Pulford family vision statement is growing in Christ, loving our family, and building strong and healthy personal relationships. I believe that it's important to share with you that Mountain Springs has a vision statement, and that may be a great place for you to start as you're seeking through what does that look like and what's the process that we'll go through on a vision statement. But if you're to evaluate your culture and your family, I think we need to point back to, does your family have a vision statement? And again, if you're sitting here and you're like, you know what, we don't, okay, I'm owning the fact that we didn't either, okay? But it's helping us move forward now that we have one. All right, I want you to, we're gonna transition now, and I want you to watch how Naomi's vision of God drives her vision for her family and what does she think about God? What does she say about God? And what does she do in response? Then I want you to watch Ruth. What does she think about God? What does she say about God? And what does she do in response? I'm going to have you pull that uh, insert out of the bulletin one more time because on the other side is a commitment continuum. And I'll speak more about the commitment continuum after we read some more verses in Ruth. But from a flyby version, the further you are on the right, the more committed you are. And I think it's one thing to be committed to a cause like maybe being the best program in the state or being committed to a cause at work, okay? It's another thing entirely to be looking at this commitment continuum and evaluating it on, where's my commitment to Christ? And I want you to take a look at this commitment continuum without me giving any definitions or anything else. And I want you to think about where does Ruth land on this continuum? Where does Naomi land on this continuum? Because if we think about it through the lens of commitment to Christ, I think that gives us a great starting point once we're through verse 18 in, in Ruth um, to take next steps as to what we can do for great culture in our homes. So keep this in mind as we're reading Ruth uh, chapter 1 verse 6 and we're going through verse 18. So we've got the commitment continuum in mind and I want, I want to keep in mind that Ruth is the grandmother of David. So what kind of culture is she creating for her family before the, before the king of Israel is even born? And single people, if you're here right now and you think that all Tom has done is talked about what happens in the families, and if you're married and you've got kids, this is what's going on, pay attention to Ruth. If you're single here today, watch Ruth. She's single, yet she's establishing culture that will be handed down for generations and infect the entire nation. You establish and uphold your culture for your family in the years to come by how you treat and relate to others on a daily basis now. With those things in mind, let's turn to Ruth chapter 1, verse 6. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return for, from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. 
Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand is turned against me. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. And here we are on the brink of verse 16. And for those of you who have studied Ruth before, um, I'm going to tell you this is kind of that iconic scene in Ruth. Ruth chapter 1 verse 16 where Ruth is going to make a statement, a covenant statement, okay, to her mother-in-law regarding, no, if this happens, this is what I'm doing. And I want us to all focus in here on verse 16. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, even if death separates me from you. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. All right, I'm going to stop and I'm just going to ask you, you know, where would you put Ruth on the commitment continuum? Where, where would you put her at? Okay. And again, not going through every definition on this because there's a lot of different ways that we can use the commitment continuum, but committed people willingly go the extra mile to reach their goals and they take initiative to do what's necessary to get the job done. What's even better yet is being compelled. Compelled is no matter what obstacles or adversities or distractions stand in the way, they find a way. They hold themselves and their family members to a higher standard and they lift those around them up. So if the commitment continuum gives us a common language this morning to ascertain where Ruth would be, I think that a lot of us would probably place Ruth in compelled. Maybe some of you place her in committed, but I think a lot of us would put her in that green statement of either committed or compelled. Bearing in mind where Ruth's commitment level is, let's turn our focus to Naomi for just a second. Naomi thinks that God's hand is against her. She thinks that there's no hope for the future. She doesn't trust God's covenant. She doesn't trust God's word. All she can see is what's directly in front of her face. Some of you this morning might be in a place like that. Maybe your marriage has hit a rough spot. Maybe your finances are a wreck. Maybe your children are not turning out the way that you would want them to turn out. If that's you this morning, church, I'm going to encourage you to take a breath and to think about, okay, if this is where we are, where do we want to be? And where's your commitment level to Christ? Because if we calibrate our commitment level to Christ and we, have a, and we seek him and we develop a vision, then going to where you want to go is something that will happen. Without a high level of commitment to Christ, without a vision, then what you're currently doing may not yield different results if you just keep doing that. So my encouragement to you is if you feel like, if you're in a place like Naomi was, where you feel like the, the hand of the Lord is against you, my encouragement to you is take a breath, evaluate the situation where your commitment level is to Christ, and take time to develop a vision statement. The New Testament is full of promises and commands that are guaranteed to bear good fruit in your life. But without vision, without a vision, you may not be able to have the eyes to see that. All that you can see is that it seems like God is out of touch. Church, I can promise you that we're all on God's radar and nothing that happens in our lives doesn't first go through his hands. Now let's take a look at Ruth. We've already talked about where she's at in the commitment continuum. And even though we may not know why, Ruth has come to believe that God is trustworthy and worth pursuing even when the outcome is uncertain. She faces a hopeless situation like many of us do. But she decides that being part of God's family is worth the adversity and the uncertainty. What does she say? She makes a covenant statement to the God of Israel in verse 16 and 17. And, and Ruth says to Naomi, to Naomi, where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. In this moment, Ruth exemplifies Romans 5 verses 3 and 4. Even though that hadn't been written by Paul yet, Romans 5 verses 3 and 4. In the, uh, I'll, I'll, read, I'll read that to you. It says, not only so, but we also glory. And in the ESV, it says we rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that our suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. I'm going to read that verse one more time, those verses one more time. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Now, 
I want to share with you that I have felt firsthand the hand of the Lord disciplining me when it felt like destruction. Back in 2003, I was in my spring semester of my junior year at college at the University of Wisconsin, River Falls, and I had been a backup quarterback for four years, and I was getting ready. Well, so I say junior year, but it was like my fourth year there, and I had one more because I got redshirted. So in my fourth year at River Falls, I went through um, a period of time where I was right on the brink of reaching some of the goals that I had set, some four- and five-year goals of becoming a starting quarterback at the University of Wisconsin, River Falls, stepping into some leadership roles and other uh, aspects on campus. I was getting close to completing my degree. And there were some things that happened in, during that time that really ignited me. And um, I went through a series of appointments with doctors. And at the end of those eight days, they had said that I'd gone through a manic episode and I was diagnosed as, as having bipolar type two disorder. And it was the decision of my parents and doctors that I withdraw from the university and go home. When everything that I wanted wasn't at home, it was the last place that I wanted to be. It felt like the hand of the Lord was turned against me and it was destructive to the things that I wanted to, to go after and pursue. That was a tough time in my life. Before I look back on that experience and tell you how I can view that now, I want to tell you that it, in order for me to get back on track, I needed to evaluate my commitment to Christ. So evaluating my commitment level to Christ was the first part that got me back on track. The second part was establishing a vision for who I wanted to be as an individual and how I wanted to contribute to that team. I put a goal of getting back on campus in June. And the other part to that, the other part that helped me out of that was having mentors in my life at the time. So evaluating my commitment level to Christ, establishing a vision for getting back on campus, and I set the goal of earning the starting spot at quarterback and being a captain of the team. And between March 2003 and June of 2003, through the Lord's grace, I was able to accomplish those goals. I got, back to, I got back to campus, had a job, and I was working alongside with my teammates. I earned the starting spot, and I was a captain for the team in 2003. It's not, it's not the way that I thought it would go, but the Lord had done some things to create perseverance in me. And now, looking back on that, I can see how the Lord's hand was disciplining me not destructive. It was discipline. And that produced perseverance. That perseverance produced character and character hope within me. And that continues to shape and drive the culture of my family. I'm at a place where I can give thanks for that part of my life. As terrible as it was to walk through at the time, and if you'd have met me at that point, there's probably, I would tell you there's no way I'm ever going to be thankful for this. Okay, but now I, can, now I can see that. And that episode gives me insight when I have the chance to mentor someone in my life who's struggling, whether that be on the football team, whether that be in my home, whether it be in a classroom or here at church. It's creating a culture of hope, faith, and confidence in God in my home. So let's look back um, at Naomi and Ruth for just a moment. Naomi had a vision of God that viewed his hand as destructive to her life, and that shaped her culture, permeating into her thoughts, her words, her actions. Ruth had a much different vision of God, and it produced a culture of commitment and hope. Ruth and Naomi both faced adversity. Naomi had no vision for her family. Ruth had vision. She wanted God to be the king of her life, even if it meant facing adversity. And again, she exemplifies Romans 5 for us. Ruth is a preview of her great, 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 great grandson. And if I have the number of greats wrong, I apologize. But the number, her great grandson, who would be Jesus, who had a vision of God that was so big that permeated everything he thought, said, and did. Jesus established a culture for his family, the church, that still drives us 2,000 years later. Ruth was compelled. And before we continue, I want to ask, does that describe your relationship with God? Men, specifically, would compelled describe your relationship with God? Because your family knows if you're just going through the motions. If, if, we, if we say that we're compelled, if we put an X on that and, and it's our self-analysis of where we find ourselves in our commitment to Christ, but that's not really what our family sees on a day-to-day -day basis, church, our, the fam, your family knows. And I would bet that if you would have asked Naomi at the time that she would say that she was a good Jew, but none of her thoughts, words, or actions were bearing fruit. The commitment continuum gives us a great it's a great tool for us to analyze where somebody else is at 
And I think that it's pretty comfortable when we're looking at, well, Ruth is here or Naomi's here. Eh, there's, a, there's a level of being comfortable there. At Palmer Ridge, what we do is we take this commitment continuum and we put it on two sides of a piece of paper and we ask the young men to evaluate themselves. So the self-analysis is, is still pretty comfortable. They put something down and I ask them to tell us why. And then they flip that over and it's the same commitment continuum on the back side of the card. And then we have their teammates evaluate them and they put check marks or X's where, where they see each other. And when those things are not congruent, it gives us a great opportunity to speak into their lives about their commitment level and to speak about why is it here when you think it's there. That's a great activity for a team to step into. Church, I'm going to ask you to use the commitment continuum to evaluate yourself, but I'm also going to ask you in, in the next week to have, some, to have three of your closest friends evaluate you as well. And I think that when you have three of your closest friends who are going to be honest with you and tell you where your commitment level to Christ is, I think that that's going to be a great launch point for you to um, establish where you're at with Christ and then to take a look at what you can do to cast a vision for where you want to go if, if it's not lining up. So the commitment continuum is a great tool that we use at Palmer Ridge, and it's also a great opportunity for you to um, take a look at and evaluate your commitment to Christ in your home. All right, we're going to finish up the, the first chapter of Ruth. And so turn with me, if you're not already there, to uh, verse 19. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me, and the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. If you've never read the entire book of Ruth, I'm going to encourage you to read the next four chapters at some point, either today or tomorrow, because it's a before the end of the book of Ruth, Naomi's faith will be restored. She will see the faithfulness of God, and some of you come from very hard families. It's great encouragement to show that God is at work, even in the seemingly darkest of times, quietly preparing you for what's yet to come. What we see in Ruth is that God Almighty reigns in the lives of men and women, and he can be trusted. God's providence is sometimes very hard, but if you have a vision to understand that what's coming at you that seems hard at the time is producing perseverance, then your attitude towards that adversity is going to be much different than feeling like the Lord's hand is against you. Some of you here today might be like Naomi, and you think that the mess that you've made is too big. A vision for my family or for myself as an individual is irrelevant. It's not true. Don't ever think that the sins in your past means there's no hope for your future. A vision for your life is critical because it helps you see how God's discipline in your life helps produce perseverance, character, and hope. If that's hard for you to see right now, a mentor in your life might be necessary. A mentor can be someone who's currently, who you currently have a personal relationship with. It's been my experience that someone with 10 to 15 years, more years of life experience than you could be a great asset. And if you're at a point in your life where you believe everything is going great, I'm going to tell you just wait. Okay, the storm clouds are on the horizon. If it feels like everything's going great and smooth sailing, there's still a need for a mentor in your life. And I would challenge all of you to perfectly consider being, being either a mentor or being mentored. And as you get equipped, mentoring someone else. Because if we're doing that as a church community, that's really going to be um, the way that we're going to grow the fastest and become the type of families that God has called us to be. Your vision of God drives your vision for your family and your vision for your family drives your culture. Church, I'm going to ask you, before we uh, go into our three closing points and action steps, I'm going to ask you to turn back to this diagram that has our pillars and our three foundational layers. And if you've got a pen with you, I'm going to challenge you to draw one more sub-layer underneath where it says healthy personal relationships. So our, our foundation at Palmer Ridge is healthy personal relationships, loyalty, work ethic. Those are the critical things that everybody has to know and be able to do before they uh, begin work with us. But below healthy personal relationships, I'm going to ask you to write in personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the foundation that all of this stands on. Without a, without a strong personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it's going to be difficult for us to maintain healthy personal relationships in and outside of anything that we do. 
So a healthy personal relationship with Jesus Christ is the, is the foundation that all of this sits on. The other part that I'm going to ask you to think about and be honest with yourself is this. Maybe you made a commitment to Christ years ago. Maybe years ago you were compelled. But in the years since that decision, your commitment to Christ has slidden back. Today, I want you to evaluate where you're at with that decision for Christ. Because we can recommit to Christ any day. And if you've never had a chance to make that decision, if you've never had a chance to start that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to have an opportunity here today in just a few minutes to come up and pray with somebody to ask Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. And when you do that, you've established the groundwork for all these things to come true in your life to seek a vision, to have a God-centered vision for your family so that your family can be the type of family that God is calling you to be. But church, I'm going to tell you, without a strong foundation, without that personal relationship with Christ, that the other things that you try to build may not last. It may not bear fruit. So hang with me here as we close out on three action steps, and then we're going to give you an opportunity to come up front and, get, and receive prayer. All right, so what's critical for championship culture in your home? We just talked about the first one, evaluating your relationship and your commitment to Jesus Christ. Today, you've got that opportunity to take that step forward and to either make that initial decision to commit to Christ or to recommit and, and move yourself to the right on that continuum. Church, I promise you that those decisions are going to bear fruit. And that's the groundwork to answering questions about family vision and culture, starting with your relationship with Jesus Christ. Second, establishing a vision for your family. And if you've got kids in the home, I'm going to challenge you to have a vision for your family that your kids could explain. I'm going to challenge you to pray about it, to be collaborative, and to think about what you want that process to yield. Okay, so think about, think about the walls, think about painting the walls and the bulb. And that, that question that we're wrestling with this morning is, is our current culture helping us be, get, to be the kind of family that God has called us to be? And remember that that vision statement, it's necessary, and it's also something that's fluid and can be revisited. The last part that um, I'm going to talk about in step number three is to engage in this process with a mentor or mentors. Just eight to 10 months ago, Allie and I were at a point with our finances where um, we had used up some of the stuff that we had been saving and uh, we were, it was month to month. And there were things that we were doing that, that um, we were making decisions much like a Limelac where we were just making decisions that seemed like best at the time based on what was right in front of our face. Okay, so if the vehicle needed new tires, we had to get new tires. If, it needed if we had another need, we were putting bombs on targets. But it, it, there wasn't a vision that we were following within that. A mentor in our life helped us devise a financial game plan that allowed us to do some things in our home, put our house up on the market, and praise the Lord, that house sold, and we were able to use some of that money to eliminate debt so that we're in a better spot financially month to month. And now we have an established savings, and we're able to buy a house up in Monument, the, the area that we've been teaching in for 11 years. And without that mentor's help, we wouldn't be in the spot that we are today. Understand that as a mentor, um, you're going to speak into lives and give people insight that they wouldn't be able to have on their own. But if you're going to be mentored, remember that you can't do it on your own. You need that other help. So church, I'm going to ask that all of us would stand right now as we prepare uh, to close out this sermon. And um, we're, we'll, we'll end in prayer. I've got one more piece that I'll talk about. But while I'm talking about that, if, if our prayer team could come up front, um, that would be much appreciated. So church, as we're launching into this fall with our small groups, um, I'm going to ask that you would prayerfully consider, um, one, being a part of a small group, but two, possibly um, being a mentor or having somebody to mentor you, um, because that is really the way that we're going to have the kind of culture that allows us to um, be the kind of families that God has called us to be. Um, at this time, uh, Allie, would you mind coming up? So church... There's been a lot that we've gone through today. We've talked about culture. We talked about water. We talked about how, what that water looks like if it's contaminated. And my reminder to you is that Jesus Christ is the one that's going to clean up that water. It's going to clean, he will clean the culture in your family. Jesus Christ, you have to have a relationship with him for him to come in and do that. And if you've never done that before, I'm going to ask that you would come forward here in just a moment. I'm going to start praying. 
while I'm praying, I'm going to ask that if, that if that nudge is in your heart, that you would come forward and find somebody to pray with. Additionally, if, you've, if it's time for you to recommit to Christ, if you made that decision and it was years ago and you've kind of slid on the commitment continuum, I'm gonna ask that you would come forward and also receive prayer because your family needs you to be compelled. Your family needs you to have that high level commitment to Christ. Your family doesn't need you to be lukewarm. Your family needs you all in. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to stand before this group today and to share some of the things that you've convicted me of and you've put on my heart. Father God, I pray for the individuals here right now in the congregation that don't have a relationship with your son. I pray that you would urge them to take that first step to come down the aisle, to find that smiling face up here near the stage, Father God, that they would engage in a life-changing event that would allow them to change the culture in their home. Father God, it's a game changer. I pray for the ones that have already committed to Christ, but they've slid in the years since that decision. I pray that you would move them forward Father God, here in this room to pray with somebody that they can recommit to Christ and that that would be a catalyst that changes the culture in their home today. So to those of you that are in the congregation, if you're struggling with a financial wreckage, if you're struggling in your marriage, if your kids aren't turning out the way that you would hope them to be, pray that you would take that step closer to the front that we could pray with you and that we could meet with you and mentor you because the commitment to Christ is going to be the thing that you do that changes everything. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity. Pray that you would continue to do the ministry that, that you have in store. Even after we close out, Father God, I pray that you'd be moving the hearts of those that are here today. In Jesus' name.